great. And um, I wanted to start by just taking the first 10 minutes or so to outline um, the research I've been doing um, over the last few weeks. Hello, Amy, a big, big welcome to you. I'm just gonna mute you. Hopefully you'll do a lot of speaking later. Um, <clears throat> the research I've been doing over the last uh, few weeks, I feel a little uh, late to this party in many ways, and I know Amy and others have been um, involved for a lot longer. Um, but I wanted to just, because you may not all have had a chance to read or watch um, all the links that I put on the Facebook group. Um, so I'm just going to take the first 10 minutes to show you some slides, if that's okay, and then we'll go into um, open discussion. So here we go, just going to share some slides now. Okay. Okay, can you all see that? Great. So I wanted to start with um, a warning. Because um, I actually thought long and hard about um, whether I should even do this, because a lot of it, as, as a lot of you know, is scary stuff. Um, I'm going to share some harsh realities with you all, uh, which aren't for the faint-hearted. So I'd say you trust your wisdom and, and I wouldn't lose any respect for you if you said, oh, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I can't, I can't cope with this right now. Um, but I really feel the reason for this call is I really feel that the 3P community in particular has a great contribution to make potentially to this whole um, catastrophe, crisis, emergency, whatever you want to call it. And that's, that's what I wanted to explore with you. Um, and I have to say, for me personally, over the last few weeks, I have been on a complete roller coaster of emotions. Um, and I know where my experience is coming from, <laughs> um, but it's been, it's been pretty full on um, through grief, sadness, despair, um, guilt, uh, hope, um, all sorts of emotions, and they've been very, very intense, um, which kind of segues into how I think we might help the world, help humanity. So here are some, um, here are some facts. Um, there is an abyss opening up before us, but we need to be brave enough to look into that abyss, and only then will we know what to do. And it's really interesting because I think um, it's kind of shifted even in the last few months, this whole discussion. There are very few people I come across who are kind of outright climate change deniers these days, uh, except for a certain president, maybe. Um, but these days it's kind of shifted to become much more subtle and nuanced. So um, I hear lots of people saying things like are on this slide, you know, well, it's okay because the government has it in hand. We've committed to zero carbon by 2050. We have the Paris Accord. Um, so, you know, it's all going to be okay. Um, or we all just need to do our bit um, as individual citizens, um, you know, recycling, avoiding single-use plastic, um, and it can all be mitigated. And, and, and I'm all for mitigation, and we certainly need to do that. But there's a kind of um, a denial there of the huge um, societal and global changes that are needed. Um, then I hear a lot, well, humanity is always very resourceful and creative. We'll come up with some solution that's kind of, you know, geoengineering or, or a, a high tech solution. Um, so, you know, let's push it to the, to the technical genius, geniuses. It's not that bad. There's no need to panic. Here's some counter evidence I've found. I've been having lots of wonderful conversations with contacts and friends and colleagues recently who are, you know, keep pointing me to 
scientists that are that are saying different things and and, and um, you know that this is just all part of the natural cycle or they say yeah bad things are probably going to happen but it's a long time in the future and it's and it's far away <laughs> um, so kind of pushing it out there in terms of the time horizon and the geographical location and then I, I have a lot of people who say, I just don't have the headspace to worry about that. I don't have the headspace to worry about one more thing at the moment. I've got enough on my plate. So, <clears throat> as I say, fewer and fewer people are denying what's happening, but there's a, there's a subtle shift going on, which I think is still a form of denial. So here we go. What's happening now? Carbon emissions, we know. Climate warming um, is happening at a much, much higher rate than was predicted even two years ago or a year ago. Uh, the polar ice melt far faster than anybody previously thought uh, with the catastrophic associated sea level rises. Um, the under ice methane release that's starting to happen and, and um, is, is, you know, methane is 30 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. There's something called the albedo effect if you haven't come across that, which is a feedback loop so that as, as more and more of the ice melts, um, more and more of the, uh, the, the, the warming gets reflected back onto what's called dark water, which means that that speeds the warming up even more. We've got deforestation, we've got wildfires, we've got species extinction. Um, one species going extinct at the moment every 10 minutes. Um, and it's thought to be like just so much higher than because there is natural extinction throughout history. But this is, you know, this has gone completely um, out of kilter with, with, with any prediction or anything that's happened before. The weather impacts on farming and agriculture, droughts, famine. We see these happening all over the world. Soil degradation. And one of the things that I hadn't realized is how much of that's happening in the UK. Those of you that are um, that are over here, um, you know, some some credible commentators are talking about we simply aren't going to be able to grow our own food, even if even if we were you know able to do that in the, in the United Kingdom because of the soil degradation, desertification, ocean warming, and acidification of the oceans, loss of marine ecosystems. There are whole, uh, what are called dead zones now in the ocean, um, which are becoming bigger and bigger, where not only does no, is no life able to exist because of the lack of oxygen, um, but anything that goes near those dead zones is also getting, um, is, is kind of soaking up the toxins from that. Water pollution, um, lack of drinking water and water for irrigation, which is caused by uh, glaciers disappearing, um, especially in places like Asia um, and other places. Pollution, air quality, catastrophic weather events, and we're already starting to see large numbers of climate refugees. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, I've just got some, some other kind of quotes and facts down there. By the way, I'm happy to send this slide pack to anybody that wants it um, after, the, after the call. So that's what's happening now, right? Um, and then <clears throat> the people that I've been speaking with and the organizations and the commentators um, who've been looking at this are predicting what's coming, which is take a deep breath, uh, even more terrifying. Um, the collapse of agriculture, massive food insecurity, disruption of supply chains, empty supermarkets in the UK, um, and famine all across the world. The climate refugee situation and associated chaos, um, and, and you know estimates vary, but it could be in the hundreds of millions or even billions. The spread of disease vectors due to temperature increases. And then there's a whole other thing about as the permafrost melts, um, you know, diseases are released. I was watching one thing about um, 
smallpox actually being found under underneath the permafrost which is melting and maybe even diseases we we've never come across before collapse of the financial system rioting civil unrest a complete collapse of institutions governments society uh, and then wars of course over increasingly scarce resources um, so a kind of you know really a mad max type scenario and then some people are saying complete extinction so <clears throat> And there's a, there's a book called The End of Ice by a guy called Dar Jamail, who, who says that even if everything we are doing and are planning on doing to mitigate, even if that all worked completely successfully, we've got a locked in um, increase of three degrees centigrade. And it's locked in because of time lag um, and various other factors. So, yeah, and lots of commentators are saying, you know, if you're not, in one way, if you're not terrified, you don't understand what's going on. Um, and we'll talk later about how terror may not be the most appropriate response, but, you know, I think it's fairly natural and human when you look at all of these uh, findings to, uh, to get pretty scared. Um, so the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, in their last report, October 2018, said that we have to do the impossible every year for the next 12 years in order to avoid a catastrophe. And remember that the IPCC is known to be highly conservative. <laughs> and cautious. And I only found out about two weeks ago that all of their findings have to go through, they have to be approved through a panel of politicians and economists before they get released to the public. So, um, you know, it's kind of, it's probably worse than they're saying it is. So it's a very familiar message to most of us by now, but it's still a, a difficult message to hear. Um, and there is this enormous reluctance to face change, um, to look into this abyss and see what, what we can do. Um, and of course, it's bigger than just the physical climate change stuff. You know, if we look at what got us here in the first place, um, I mean, I think that Gus Speth said it all. He used to think that the biggest problems facing the planet were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. And he said, I believe that within 30 years, good science could address these problems. But then he went on to say, I was wrong. The top environmental problems are an obsession with economic growth, selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation and we scientists don't know how to do that. So what to do now? Well, I just wanted to share with you a couple of um, commentators that I've been following closely. This one's a guy called Rupert Reed, who's an academic philosopher. He's in the Green Party. He's also a spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion. Um, and he's come up with these eight kind of uh, things on the to-do list. You know, number one, we've got to wake up. Number two, we've got to feel it. And I think this is really important. Um, to not kind of repress or suppress or deny these feelings, but, but not to get stuck in them either. Um, then there's lifestyle changes. We all know about those. Conventional lobbying. Building local communities. Um, you know, for example, looking at ways to grow food together and that sort of thing. And then transformative adaptation. Um, again, in the links I sent you, uh, you'll see him talking about these things in a lot more detail and giving more examples. So I'm just going to go through them really quickly. Um, deep adaptation, which is about getting really radical right now to prepare 
for the probability of collapse. So thinking about, you know, not how are we going to mitigate this, but how, although that's important too, but how are we going to start preparing now for the, the civilization that comes after um, the one that we've created right now? Just one example on seed banks, for example, the, um, you know, that's, that's a good example of something we need to start planning now. And there was one in Svalbard, right up in the far north, um, where we thought the, the, the seed banks were incredibly secure because we, we kind of put them under the ice and the ice has melted. And also because of um, ravaging fires in the Arctic, if you can believe it, um, a lot of them have melted, so we don't have them anymore. So starting to think about, you know, what, what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about all the, all the nuclear power stations that are on the coast because they need lots of water? You know, think about sea rises and coastal nuclear power stations. Um, just rethinking everything, rethinking what matters. And then his last one is, you know, he says very, very... Um, starkly we need to rebel and of course that's what extinction rebellion and the other the school strikes and various other movements are doing um right now we've seen a lot of that in london um, and we'll, we'll see a lot more of it this evening the natural history museum is hosting a dinner um, in one of their grand halls for the petroleum companies if you think of the the irony of having a dinner for the petrol and oil companies underneath a whole load of extinct species. I mean, it just beggars belief, but I get it from their point of view. They need money. The Natural History Museum needs money. Um, so Extinction Rebellion are gate crashing that tonight. So look out for that on the news in a, in a big way. But peaceful, non-violent, civil disobedience and disruption, he says is the key. And then lastly, we're coming to the end now, this Professor Jem Bendel, he wrote an academic paper in late 2018 and it went viral, uh, which is like academic papers don't do that. Um, half a million downloads so far. And again, uh, I can send you a copy of it. He's saying it's too late for mitigation, although we should do that as well. It's time to accept the oncoming uh, collapse and begin to prepare for a very different civilization. And he talks about the four R's. Uh, resilience. And I think these are really useful questions, actually. So resilience, what is it that we most value and want to keep? Relinquishment. What must we give up in order not to make matters worse? And I love that he says, you know, maybe this is all an enforced letting go of things that never made us happy in the first place. Restoration. What is it that we can bring back that's already been lost? And reconciliation and reconnection. What can we do to make peace with, to love, support others, to lessen suffering? How can we live with peace, even joy? Um, and he's very clear that, you know, there needs to be a, a spiritual, um, awakening uh, a complete kind of transformation in consciousness and that there's a way through despair which is love um so i've got a lot of time for him so last slide then our role is the 3p community um you may have seen that there's a whole new profession um, beginning to emerge eco counselor eco psychologist eco coach Helping people to cope with <clears throat> despair, sadness, grief. Um, the trouble is, from my point of view, they're all coming, nearly all of them are coming from a psychoanalytic or an outside-in paradigm. Um, and I've spoken with lots of activists as well over the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> and whilst they're all advocating uh, peaceful, non-violent approaches, you sense in them <clears throat> an understandable rage and, and fear. Um, 
so that's my question. Could we help people return to wisdom, clarity, love, connection, compassion, and creativity as we face this emergency? So there we are. And um, I'm sorry that took rather longer than I expected, but I hope if there's interest, we could make this the first of a series of calls. So over to you, who, um, <clears throat> who wants to kick us off? Yes, Erica. Yes, um, hi, um, I've had the, um, well, I've been around this issue for a very long time. Um, I live in Totnes in the southwest of the UK, which is the kind of mothership of a movement called the Transition Town Movement, which some of you may have heard of. Um, which was set up about 12 or 13 years ago to um, kind of demonstrate positive examples of transitioning to a better future. Um, and, um, and I've been part of that movement ever since I moved here 12 years ago. And um, I have, and so I, um, the person, one of the people who founded that was, was Rob Hopkins. Um, who lives just around the corner from me and has written a book which is coming out soon called from from what from what is to what if and what he talks about in that is in recognition of all the stuff that you talked about Kim is that humans do have the power of imagination which has often been suppressed or um, sort of lost in the sort of distractions and the, the stress and you know all this you know, people getting caught up in the noise of their head fundamentally is the way we would put that um, but he is actually quite a lot more optimistic uh, than Jem Bendel um, and, and, and Rupert Reed. Now I also had the good fortune that we had um, a retreat um, here in Totnes before Christmas with Jem Bendel and Rupert Reed there. So I spent three days with them and other people talking about all the stuff to, to do with um, deep adaptation. Um, and in some, ways, I, I, in some ways I found that quite um, refreshing because to me it felt honest in a way that i would not heard before about you know the real threats that we meet but it the criticism that i've heard of of their work is that they have slightly cherry-picked the worst um right. and that i mean my personal view for what it's worth is that frankly we don't know yeah that that that, that what jem bendel predicts could happen of course it could but when Rob Hopkins book comes out, it comes out shortly, is that he has gone around Europe in particular, um, but also looked around the world. And there are some amazing examples of people making changes in their communities, uh, which really are hopeful and, you know, demonstrate that you, you know, we do, we actually do have the capacity as humans to work together um, constructively, imaginatively, lovingly to potentially make make a difference um and sorry i didn't hear that what's the name of the book again from uh from it's from what is to what if so it's like what if you know what if we you know sort of you know what if we did you know grow all our own food what if you know so that then that's it's in that sense um yeah. so um yeah so i i saw Rob gave a presentation um, a couple of weeks ago on the contents of his book and I've been following his blogs about it anyway and yeah I mean and it's really you know it's really uplifting and inspiring so I think what I really wanted to say was that although you can very easily get very caught up in all the doom and gloom you know there are there is another side to the story and that there is already good stuff happening. Well that's fantastic thank you Erica so much I will look out for the book I had come across Transition Towns but it felt very kind of um small and patchy if you like rather than that no i mean that's true <coughs> transition town in this country is it's much bigger news in france and belgium okay. um for some reason um and what's happened there is that whole villages and small towns have transformed the way they work together as a community is partly to do with the way local politics works over there that the people have the local 
authorities have far more autonomy than they do in this country. But, anyway, okay. all the, but nonetheless, they have achieved, you know, quite a lot of really quite inspiring stuff. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Who else? Shannon, is that? Hi, yeah. Um, thank you for organizing this. This is so exactly what I want to be talking about. <laughs> like, so um, my background is I have a degree in environmental studies and philosophy. And um, I kind of came across the same thing where like, when I was doing my degree, we did, you know, political ecology, ecological restoration, all these different topics. And it was so clear that all of the systems that we operate under currently capitalism, consumerism, the way our agriculture is. Um, I think the phone is unmuted. If I don't have the power to mute them, but if you could, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah. what was I saying? Um, yeah, so, and they basically, my teacher said the same thing. They're like, we know that other systems need to be in place in order to prevent the worst case scenario, but we don't know how to do the spiritual and cultural transformation that needs to take place. Like we know we can't live under capitalism. Anymore. We literally can't do constant economic growth on a planet with finite resources. The math doesn't add up, but we don't know how to make that happen. And then I um, came across a principle right after graduating. And so for me, I instantly saw the link between if people understood this, they would naturally have more love for each other, more love for their planet, more love for themselves. They would naturally make wiser decisions. Like the choices that I've made in my life just from understanding this. I'm like, well, if I'm just one person, if everybody did this, then we would, you know, have massive impacts. But I agree. It's really, um, so I'm just so distracted by the phone being not muted. Um, <laughs> Whoever's on the phone, if you could please mute yourself, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it was like literally yeah. um, pulling my attention. Um, but yeah, so and in the past few months, this has literally been kind of the only thing I've been asking myself um, is how do we, us in this community who is so fortunate to have an accurate understanding of how the mind works, how do we bridge that gap between what's so clearly of the broken systems that, you know, like it doesn't take a genius to realize that the way that we're living is completely unsustainable. Um, you don't have to have, you know, uh, an education in sustainability like I do to see that. It's kind of completely obvious. But at the same time, I'm like, well, it seems like fear is almost, a, a, I don't say more effective because it's not, but a, a quicker thing than love. I feel like love is a slow, gentle and I just feel like we may not have the time for love. So I asked Linda Pransky this on a webinar last week. And uh -huh. yeah, because <laughs> um, I was like, Linda, like, I so see the link here. I know that an understanding of the principles would um, be kind of crucial to us getting where we need to go before, you know, we get to this irreversible point. But I just don't see it happening in the time. And Linda's response was basically, well, you know, when, whenever you, she's like, there's always hope. And whenever we give up on hope, that's when we close the door to new ideas, new, um, whether it's a technology, whether it's a solution, whether it's a new idea of how to, you know, make change happen on a bigger scale. So she just kind of reminded me, like, the biggest thing you want to look out for is overwhelming pessimism, because that's going to crush progress and crush what you're trying to do faster than anything else. Um, and so that was really reassuring. And then I also talked to Mara about it on a webinar two days ago. And she said that, um, and I guess I'm like asking everybody, I'm getting on every webinar and being like, so what do we do about the climate crisis? Me too. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I was talking to Mara about it and Mara basically said that she also, like we talked about on this call, like we don't actually know. These are predictions. These are, on some cases, they're a lot more conservative because they have to be published. And in some cases, they're... Um, kind of, you know, like we say, oh, it's going to be World War III, but we don't actually know that. People have thought that in the past. So there is a degree to uncertainty. And Mara was basically saying that she likes to think she's wrong. Like she would rather, um, she would rather be proven wrong about how bad things are than, and be like, whoo, 
good thing that we yeah. made the better made the world better for nothing basically instead of doing the opposite so um so i'm very interested in this i'm 25 and so everybody in my kind of sphere and generation um this is kind of all we talk about at girls night at the dinner table on hikes is like how do we get into this mess and what the fuck are we going to do about it and <laughs> nobody really knows um but having these conversations i think is really inspiring and and hopeful and to me, although I don't, I still go back and forth between like, we, we kind of need love and fear, like not we need fear, but we need the urgency of realizing that we can't just be like, oh, I'm going to cut down my, like, you know, I'm going to cut down my meat from eating it seven days a week to eating five days a week. Like that's going to do something. It's like, no, like bigger things have to happen. But I still think that without the foundation of love and without the understanding of, hey, we have this wisdom within us. We have this love within us. And there is so much that we don't know that can come into form literally as soon as tomorrow. Um, I think we kind of need both for what it's worth. But yeah, I'll let somebody else speak. Thank you, Kim, for organizing this. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, I've been asking everybody as well and um, been having fascinating conversations with Michael, Neil, and um, Dick and Bettinger, and also Jamie, who's here with us. Hi, Jamie. Say hi. Hi, I didn't realize I was unmuted. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Good. Well, you know. <laughs> Under the circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's your take on all this? Well, I... There's a way in which I've kind of sidestepped into, until now on the basis of it looks to me like until until this understanding is seen as kind of the paradigm for psychology then the chance of putting paid to the levels of greed fear resentment jealousy anger uh perceived victimhood and all that sort of stuff that drives these kind of cycles is pretty slim to be honest. And so I kind of felt like the place where I can make the biggest difference is doing whatever I can to help establish this understanding as a mainstream orthodoxy. That in itself seems to be slow progress, but compared to 10 years ago when I, I, I first came into contact with this understanding, word is sh like it's way more mainstream now than it was a decade ago so i think i think it, it's it's moving in the right direction I, I guess the thing i see is there's a there on the on the one hand there's a a truth to kind of um the kind of it'll happen if it's meant to happen, wait for wisdom to show the way and all that sort of stuff. And, I, and, and there's a truth in that. And there's also a truth in, hey, you got to do what makes sense to you yeah. uh, today. And often, I, I guess the thing I'd say that, that might be relevant to some people on this call is when it comes to kind of making making a noise and making a difference I, I think one of the things that a lot of the activist groups get right is they're not scared of doing big and scary and getting uncomfortable and i think a lot of people have got the message somehow that the doing the right thing always involves in always involves being in a good feeling and it right. really doesn't like if the truth if the truth of this understanding is that we're always living in the experience of the principle of thought taking form in the moment and nothing else, then your feelings don't know about the future or, or yeah. how, uh, how, <laughs> how uh, uh, dangerous something is or how out of your comfort zone something is or any of that stuff. They just know what's running through your thought system. And so I guess what I'd say to anyone is that I think the other thing we probably need a healthy dose of is uh, courage. Yeah. And courage, uh, courage, sometimes courage to do big and scary, sometimes courage to change our ways. Like I, I look at my, you know, you and I were having a conversation today, Kim. Yeah. 
and I look at the degree of climate, climate criminality currently uh, at play in my own life, like the trip I just came back from Sainsbury's with my bag of steaks and, uh, you know, my plastic carrier bag and that sort of thing while driving my three liter car and so on. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, it also takes courage to say, okay, I'm going to change my ways, even though that's uncomfortable, potentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I'm certainly starting to do that uh, in, in ways that are uncomfortable for me. I'm, I'm I, I, you know, I've, I've made a commitment to not fly. Um, you know, meat certainly gone. Um, but it's, <clears throat> I think you're right about the, uh, the big scary things. I've been, although I don't agree with everything Extinction Rebellion says or does, what, I, what I'm seeing is they are making a difference. Like just in the last, um, just in the last couple of months, you know, the, the impact they've had on, um, you know, the, the, the media, the number of meetings they've been having with government ministers and politicians and people that wouldn't give them the time of day six months ago um, is, is, is really encouraging. And as I was saying to you, Jamie, today, it's less than I think... You know, I don't necessarily think, although I have joined Extinction Rebellion, it's less that I think that's the way to do it, but more that my hope is that that will kind of get it on the agenda, get it so high on the agenda that then more, more people will be tapping into that wonderful uh, creative spirit that, that you were talking about, Erica. Um, hey, Lindsay. Hi. I'm muting you. Oh. Lovely to okay. see you. Sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah. Who else has got something to say? <clears throat> yeah, Lindsay, do you want to say something? Okay, well, sorry I'm so late, first of all. Um, we it's all right. We, you're We've, we've sorted it all out before you got it. <laughs> so, so what are the three key things that you've sorted <laughs> out? <laughs> no, we haven't. We haven't. Oh, okay. Um, I thought just as I'm traveling around the world that um, I'd share some of uh, what I've noticed um, as we've visited quite a few countries. Um, and there's quite a few things, really. Um, the, we've, we've, we're in Brazil at the moment, and uh, we can see the deforestation. Um, we've just seen monkeys going along uh, wires where there should be trees. Um, we've been to New Zealand where these enormous 2,000-year-old trees are dying. Um, there's so much rubbish on beaches all throughout the world. So, you know, I'm kind of witnessing uh, a big change to this world. The population, we were with a guy who's 93, and the, the population from when he was a child to now is just extraordinary, the difference. So, yes, we all know the kind of problems, but it's like kind of... It's interesting because on the three principles uh, perspective, we are all one. So we're, we're in a way kind of killing ourselves. And I used to think, well, planet Earth has gone through five different um, Extinction. Mass, mass yeah. extinctions so okay there will be another one but actually as uh, Tim my husband said that there are probably many planets out there that used to perhaps they used to have life and they no longer have life and is that what we're doing to this to to our to us to our planet that's that's the difference I think is in the past it, the the living organism of 
earth has survived but are we actually destroying that and that's very concerning but if we if we all did create the impossible in 90 days we might find an answer Anyway, so that's, sorry, that's, that's, that's my two pennies worth. Thank you, Lindsay. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Yeah. Who else? And it doesn't have to be, you know, you, you don't have to have something grandiose or academic or intellectual to say about this or, or new fact, like just tell me how you're feeling about it. What's, what's your experience? Yeah, Mo. Hi, um, also sorry for uh, arriving late. Um, and I may have missed uh, a, a lot of what you wanted to talk about. Um, for me, I am, um, looking at the situation now and saying what can I do and I recycle and I don't eat meat or I eat very very little meat maybe red meat once a month or something like that if that um I fly less I don't I can't say I've stopped flying but I fly a lot less than I used to but it feels like it's not enough oh. um so what else and it's is it I don't know if it's a lack of knowledge on my part Perhaps I haven't gone out and done research to decide what else. Um, you know, I see people sticking themselves to trains with super glue to try and get a message across. Is that the right route? I, I, I honestly don't know, but you, you sort of pose the question, then it, I might not have to say anything profound, just maybe um, talk about how I'm feeling. I just feel uh, disempowered and a, a little bit sort of, naive i suppose is to some people seem to know you know we've got to go and talk to governments and we've got to stick ourselves to trains and we've got to sleep in the center of london in the middle of the roads and hold everybody so somebody notices and i guess what i'm saying is what else i'm not going to stick myself to a train or lie in the middle of the road i don't think but is that because it's, i'm it's interesting because i i would now and that's that's a direct result of what I've what I've learned over the last two weeks. And I've never seen myself as any kind of activist. You know, I'm not like you, Shannon, or you know, other people who who who've done this for years. I've never been that. That's not who I am. You know, um, but but I actually think there is a real case for saying the 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 political, the societal contract has been broken. Um, you know, not, <clears throat> and I think there's even, you know, I said at the beginning, sorry, you missed it, Mo, but that, that nobody outright denies climate change anymore, except maybe Trump, but um, that, that there's a kind of a subtlety of denial going on now. And, and one of them, you know, there's even a very widespread view that, this thing about, well, it's you, Mo, you've got to change, is, is part of the kind of lie um, so that large political systems don't have to really dismantle what they're doing. It's kind of, let's put the blame on you, the individual. Um, but, you know, even if, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's kind of too little, too late, really. But the, the blame is on us as individuals. We well, probably did a lot of it utterly naively, not knowing any better or, you know, I don't know whether ignorance is any kind of excuse, but it's only since I recently watched the David Attenborough thing that I went, oh, okay, stop eating beef and lamb. Fair enough. That helps. Yeah. And stop flying. And yeah, and maybe that's just because I'm, I've never had that in my world, but it is on us. I saw a documentary. I mean, we we share that we certainly share the responsibility and the blame, but it's kind of like it's become a uh, no, you know, we, the government, aren't going to, um, we're not going to stop subsidizing fossil fuel companies. We're going to subsidize fracking. We're going to, you know, carry on um, 
doing all of these things that are policy that that kind of um, just just are making the situation worse and worse and worse. And and then they're kind of saying, but you've got to have a you've got to have a bamboo toothbrush. You know, it's it's kind of it's it's to do with the the you know you said disempowered. Um, and of course we should all be doing stuff like that. We should all be having lifestyle changes, but it's, it's kind of a bit, what's the word? It's, it's, there's a cynicism in that, which means that we, you know, we can, we can still carry on strip mining the earth at a strategic policy level. Do you see what I mean? I do. Uh, I saw a, a, a drama last night years and years or something like that and i just saw a clip of it where there was a woman sitting at the table and she was saying you know the, the state of the world at the moment it's down to us you know when you know, we carried on buying plastic bags we carried on buying meat we kept this it's kind of a thing set in the future but um, that's why sorry i'll let you finish and then i'll just no, want it's, it's just simply that it's um so if i want to make a difference do I just stop eating meat, stop flying and stop using plastic? Or do I have to do something else? And if I have to do something else, what is more effective? Write to the MPs? Do I have to stick myself to a train? I know I'm being extreme with that, but I do, I do feel like, probably like so many people, yes, I'd like to do something, but I'm not, I don't really know what that is. Yeah. Or where I fit in to, I'm quite happy to write to the MP and, and tell him lots of things, but my MP is probably not going to read my letter. <laughs> yeah, but that's why I like that one of Extinction Rebellion's four demands is please start telling us the truth because, because they're not. Right. You know, even, even the IPCC and, and aren't. They're kind of, they're dialing everything down to not upset powerful lobbies. You know, so, so that's the first thing. Uh, yes, we all share the blame, but w w tell us the truth. You know, the, the people that research this for a living. So that's, that's got to change, I think. Yeah. Eva, thank you, Mo, very much. I'm wondering, there's obviously a reason why. I mean, the impact of what you've shared with us and I've, you know, Dominic's been reading a lot about this for a number of years and dropping hints <laughs> in, in to, to me that I haven't really heard until it became more public. Um, so, and he did that deliberately because of coping mechanisms when you hear such news. So there's obviously, I think there's a denial it's absolutely a denial, but I don't think, I think there's a, there is a denial by the leaders of what, what's going on, but I think also they're trying to protect, they're protecting us. So they're almost carrying on as if they're not respecting the fact that we're human beings. And as you say, where we want the truth, but the, in, the impact, can people actually cope with hearing it. We all know how we felt when we saw, saw it. And I've gone through exactly the same over the last month or so. Deep grief, I can't even look at my children. I just go out the house, I have to walk. I'm looking at things around me thinking, this, these beautiful things, what have we done? My children, just it's, it's it. And I think that, I don't think that, um, society could cope with that en masse. <laughs> so it's almost a <clears throat> not. And people yeah. will in their own time work it out. It's not right. But can, I mean, we know about well-being that in, in the UK, they can't cope with the well-being issues caused by stress of exams with young people. So yeah. if they, they suddenly had this, I mean, if, like Greta Thunberg, she was one person who got it and wasn't getting the answers. If that was on multitude, how would we cope with that? So there could be an obvious reason. I'm going to come to Shannon first and then uh, Alex. Um, thank you for that, Eva. It was interesting. I'll, I'll send out a link. I watched a meeting that happened on Wednesday, 
Tuesday this week, um, which was the World Wildlife Fund, Extinction Rebellion and the Climate Change Committee, having a meeting with the uh, Select Committee on Business, Energy um, mm -hmm. and the Industrial Strategy. So this was a government meeting. And they were saying the same thing, you know, is it fair, you want us to tell the truth, is it fair to do that when we, we don't really have a plan? <laughs> yeah. You know, which is kind of, I mean, and that's on YouTube. So, um, but yeah, so Shannon, over to you. Thanks, Eva. If, yeah, um, I don't know who's, I said Alex is after me. I um, don't want to take up if we have to go at the top of the hour because I want to- Well, I don't have to go at the top okay. of the hour. Okay, I don't either, but I just didn't know. If, okay, um, I <laughs> love what Mo brought up because I think that that's so true is that the conversation has shifted to like, well, what do we all have to do? We just need bamboo toothbrushes. We just need to bring reusable bags to the supermarket. We just need to, uh, you know, make these small things. But I was reading an article yesterday. Um, everyone tends to think Canada is like amazing when it comes to the environment. We're not. Um, our prime minister just passed a really dangerous pipeline yesterday, but he's up for re-election in, we have an election coming up in six months, so there's hope. Um, but basically it was talking about how the Canadian government is selling Nestle all of this valuable spring water. So Nestle can, of course, put it in plastic bottles, wrap them in plastic, ship them around the world. And yet that water is the very water that um, it's on First Nations land and is, actually in the treaty guaranteed to these people they don't have access to it there's a complete water shortage in many of the reservations in canada but yet the canadian government is just pulling in money after money after money to put it in bottles to put it in our supermarket so like it's one thing to say like well we just need less plastic like let's all just bring our nalgenes everywhere and then we can or swell bottles we'll just refill those and we'll be fine but ultimately like the, the, the thing that's having, um, I was reading a lot about the 80-20 rule this week. And in my mind, our individual stuff is the 20. And the, yeah. what governments and systems, the very fact that they are completely broken systems that don't even account for environmental impact in what they do, it's all economic. Yeah. And so the fact that the government is like, oh, I'm sorry that, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of Canadians that don't have proper drinking water and that have to literally drive hours to get enough water to give to their kids to drink. But we have no problem selling our natural resources to Nestle so that they can 100 times their profit and continue to be billionaires and continue to fly their private jets. Like that's what I see is like kind of missed in this conversation and why I'm, I love what Extinction Rebellion is doing because they're basically saying like, look, the impact that you have from switching to a plastic to a bamboo toothbrush is pennies compared to what your government is doing by subsidizing the fossil fuel industry by doing all the damages it's creating. And that's why, like, when I was, you know, I watched all the resources you sent in all the talks and I was in such deep grief for about two days, I didn't do anything. Like I just sat on my couch and cried and ate popcorn. And then I got up and I was like, okay, joining my local chapter, I'm you know, committed to this conversation. Um, and the other thing that I decided to do is I, uh, last week I quit being a coach. And I know that sounds kind of like, that's interesting, why would you do that? But I realized that um, the way that I was going about using my valuable time and resources, having one-to-one -one conversations and just, I was like, this is not the most effective use of my time. Like there is so much more I could do if I was only focused on getting the message out in bigger needs means than one-to-one. -one. Needs, needs to be a scale. It yeah. does. And so I looked at my own life and I'm like, the way I'm running my business is not aligned with my values. And so switched my career last week. So there's these things like, this is why I love what Mo brought out. There are things that we can look at and say, I'm doing things that are fundamentally not aligned with my values, with what makes sense to me, with my wisdom. But that's really only the 20%. The 80% is looking at what's actually happening on this big systemic level and saying, well, what the heck are we going to do about it? Because the very fact that we are all kind of um, thinking like, yeah, I'll just, you know, buy less meat when I go to the grocery store and then still having a government that is constantly subsidizing um, CAFOs and other really awful kind of meat production industries. It's like your impact is a drop in the ocean compared to shutting down those systems. And that's why I love what Extinction Rebellion is doing. I don't agree necessarily 
with the extent to which they take the fear out because I think it can like uh, Eva just said lead to just a lot of grief and a lot of like oh my god there's no plan here and yet I'm like faced with the truth of it and it's fucking terrifying but I do appreciate that they're actually looking at the 80 percent which I think is missed in this conversation so and and what they're saying is that we uh you know we we are very resourceful and we are very creative and if you tell people the truth they will step up yeah Um, and you know they have this idea of the um you know, having the citizens assembly and so on, and actually coming up with new ideas. Um, that was one of the, the obsession, the obsession we've got to get rid of. One of the things we've got to relinquish, I think, as a, as a planet is the obsession with growth. Yeah. The obsession with economic growth is what's driving all of it. Yeah. And, it, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be that way. We've just all kind of bought into yeah. that. that we haven't got that. It's just yeah. normal. But when I was taking yeah. political ecology classes, it was so apparent that there were way more stable, way more equitable economic systems that we can be operating under. And, you know, it's like, it's not, we're not saying, oh, we should just go back in the dark ages. Where we don't have electricity and we don't have phones. We don't have internet. But it's like, these can be run under different principles in capitalism that actually would benefit us all instead of harm us all. Yeah. So I feel like I've talked enough. I'll let Alex. Uh, Thank you, Shannon. Alex. I could listen to you all day, Shannon, so <laughs> thank you for sharing. I just, um, something came up when uh, Eva was speaking and talking about, you know, how we're not equipped to deal with the truth of what is really happening. And I just, I think on that note, as a community with this understanding, we can help serve that point and help and maybe it is too small, listening to what Sharon was just saying there, but even you know, touching our immediate communities and helping to level up that, you know, the level of consciousness and how people can deal with that as an understanding. And yeah, that was just what came up for me when you were talking then. I think that's I think that's great. I think that's great. Because it, it, it I think that you know, that there's, there's going to be a lot more of that, um, a lot more need for that, I think, even as more and more people wake up to the reality of it. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm seeing this just in where I live and that there is more and more demand for, you know, well-being, for things like mindfulness and yoga and even like my local church has more people like coming and saying, I don't know what I need, but I need something. And so that, you know, in the whole time where this swing is going on and it can look like everyone is completely materialistic and finance driven, but then there's this creeping realization that actually there's, there's something else that we all need. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Alex. Erica. Oh, sorry. Right. Sorry. Uh, I think. Sorry. sorry. I think I was on music at the same time as you were, and then we. Anyway. Sorry. Sorry. Um, that's all right. Um. Yeah, what I was sort of also thinking about in relation to how we can kind of help this process, you know, of of helping people to face the truth is that, I mean, I'm part of Extinction Rebellion, I'm in an affinity group, and what I'm finding is that, you know, simple things like supporting people that recognising that, you know, that our emotions are, are, are of, you know, fear and grief and all the rest of it are perfectly normal and human, but they do come and go and they're not something that you need to fix. Yeah. And, and I, I do talk about that a bit. And, and what I find really interesting, um, and I've 
I don't think this is entirely because I live in a top nest bubble, is that there are people out there who are kind of seeing this, who are not necessarily three principles, yeah. but, who, but who are sort of, there's, there feels to me like there is a bit of a sort of a slight upwelling of realisation of, of a truth which is a bit like three principles without necessarily using that language okay. or coming from that place. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and a rec you know a recognition and the other thing that I was going to say is that now this is sort of my thing but you know when you think of the planet as being a single system you know where you know where we're not separate we're not separate from each other nor are we separate from life life is you know we're a manifestation of life and I feel that the, whatever it is that each of us is nudged to do you know however wisdom manifests in each of us is kind of our job so. Yeah what um you know a couple of people have said that they don't know what to do and i think that you do but you kind of get very caught up in the self-judgment about what ought i to do whereas when you kind of sit back and relax and just go with ah you're frozen again erica what Oh, damn. Try and type. Am I, am I alive again? Yes, you are now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, as my, I'm, I'm getting a new internet provider next week because this one's hopeless. Anyway, um, I'm... Um, oh, God, what was I going to say? Yes, I think that whatever it is that we're moved to do is the right thing for us to do because we're all part of this tapestry. We each have our own unique thread to follow. And that, you know, so whether you're buying a bamboo toothbrush or whether you're going and setting up a new global movement, you know, they're equally valid if that's yeah. what you're moved to do. Yeah, yeah. And that, and, and that we're moved by um, the universe operating through us. And that is, so we are like the immune system for the earth in, as long as we do follow those nudges. Yeah. That's beautiful yeah we're kind of the immune system but also the disease <laughs> at the same time in some ways but well, yeah i think that's lovely i think that's lovely yeah i mean the disease is the disease is just allowing ourselves to be caught to be to be caught you know caught up in our thinking that's all yeah because everything stems from you know everything that's gone wrong has stemmed from that it's, it, and it's actually no more complicated than that that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I think that's a really important point. Like, um, what do you feel? And, you know, not now, but like, as, as you process all of this, and hopefully we'll, I'll do another one of these, we'll meet again. And, and uh, you know, if it's, a, if it's of interest, we can do regular um, creative explorations of this. And I know, but it's what are you called to do? What are you personally called to do? And um, yeah, I think that's, that's really important. By the way, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but Amy, um, who was on the call, but I know had to leave early, Amy Chen Mill's name, she's having a day on the 5th of July in, um, in London um, with, a, with a bunch of other three people looking at this topic as well. So have a look, search for that on, um, on Facebook. I can't go, unfortunately, because it clashes with my retreat. Um, otherwise, I would. But it's, it's so nice to see the level of interest in this. And um, I'm genuinely, genuinely grateful that you, that you came along. And um, I, I mean, who, who might be interested in having another, another call? um in a yeah great fantastic excellent well thank you so much lisa did you want to say something lisa okay yeah yes i i'm very happy for everything that's been said and uh and I, I kind of see this also as an op opportunity, as an opportunity for 
for everyone to wake up because that that is really what and so i really i i love what you said erica about that well the whole thing has to change from from us seeing from the inside out so so if we are guided by that and we keep on listening inside and find the answers from there so we um, can act out of love and i really do mean that is so so important and act out of uh, you know visualizing i don't know what visualizing I'm calling it because I think it has a lot of things to do with feelings but but you know really see get the ideas of how how could it be what what to be changed and so instead of we uh, and of course that's we also need that to point at other people who is doing some stupid things but I think the most important thing is that we look inside we look inside and we and we listen to that guidance. So, so people will notice that there is something different going. On. I mean, I mean, we the whole world is so fixed on 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 money. We we are having the the people, the living things is is you know I don't know where it is, but it's very very low on the on the. Uh, on the scale of what is important and what we should take care of that to be totally changed. So we need to, to wake up. That's, that's the only thing that can save us. That is, we need to wake up. So we will in the future do things differently mm -hmm. than what we have been doing for many, 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 you know, decades. Yeah. So, so I, I really just feel that we need ourselves to be, you know, the good example of, oh, I, I don't know what to call it, but, but really be very, very cautious, really be very, um, uh, we should look, where, where am I? Where am I? Where am I now? Where am I now? You know, what am I speaking from now? The, is very very important in everything of this I think yeah thank you so much <laughs> yeah yeah well and I think that's a really good point to pause because um, you know love is the answer I'm convinced of that uh, and I and I really think that we especially have a have such an opportunity and a, <clears throat> a potential to, as I said on, on the slide, to, to help people come back to love, clarity, connection, creativity, um, regardless of what actually is going to happen. Um, so I, yeah. I, I I feel more hope I feel more hopeful now than at the beginning of this call. <laughs> so thank you all for that. Um, yeah. So if you all unmute yourselves, say goodbye. I will post the recording on the Facebook group, and I'll let you know about forthcoming dates. And I'll also send you um, if you want them a copy of the uh, a copy of the slide pack that I used at the beginning. Okay, so thank you, Kim. Thank you, everyone. It's been Bye, a great everybody. Thank Bye. You, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.